Composer, pianist, and arranger Matthew Shipp is one of the most brilliant improvisers currently working. He has recorded dozens of recordings since 1988 as a leader and almost as many as a sideman with the likes of David S. Ware, Rob Brown, Matt Maneri, Whit Dickey, Roscoe Mitchell, Joe Morris, Eva Perelman, and many others. Um, I've been struck when I've seen him live how his improvisations just build this beautiful architecture of sound with all these ideas and melodies and arrangements and themes just sort of shooting out of his piano as he moves from one idea to another. And I knew he would be a great interview once we got past sort of basics of current recordings and all that. We spoke about Alice Coltrane, John Coltrane, the cosmic pianist, which he considers himself to be one of, and just the science of improvisation. And I hope you enjoyed this video chat. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to my channel. I am uh, pleased today to be in the apartment of creative composer and master improvisationalist Matthew Ship. Matthew, thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew has an incredibly large body of work. He's very prolific. His last four releases include 2018 Sonic Fiction with his quartet of that time, 2020 and 21 Piano Equation and Codebreaker, both solo piano, and his recent, most current CD on ESP is World Construct. Could you hold that up? Yes, I have that right here. Beautiful. And it's I'll a trio album with myself, Michael Bissy on bass, and Neiman Taylor Baker on drums. Great. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this record and the mind of an improviser such as yourself. I've only seen you a couple times, but they were really just astounding group interplays and improvisations, creating these like waves of composition sort of on the spot that would switch and grow. And I, I want to talk about, I know you played some rock in high school, and I'm curious also at the end on your thoughts on how we can bring more people into the music, the, the great uh, conundrum. But but tell me about Sonic World Construct. When, what went into that? Was it recorded during the pandemic? Yes, it was. In fact, inside there's a photo, which this is bound, but there's a photo of us, all our instruments wearing masks. It was recorded on um, April 15th of 2021. So that's right smack dab in the middle of the pandemic. And it came out September. What month are we in? July. It came out June of, um, in, of of this year, 2022. So it's a brand new album as we speak now. And tell me about the composing for that and what the theme is to the record, if any, or what changes from previous work. Right. Well, it's instrumental music, so it's kind of hard to talk about a theme in, in general kind of um, prosaic language. Um, I would say the theme is that this trio keeps evolving naturally and organically on its own. So any slice at any particular time can be looked at as where the trio is now. Um, I, I, I've been really, like I constantly think of ways to kind of organize group interplay, ways to psychologically bring things out of the other players. And in that way, kind of the model is um, Duke Ellington because he was a master psychologist with his band members. And in some ways, even though there's pen going to paper with Strayhorn and Ellington, in a lot of ways, the compositions are based on the psychology of the players and, and those people as organizers being able to bring things out of the players. So that is in the back of my mind. Um, the people that I work with, what are their strengths? What are their possible latent strengths that they don't usually emphasize? How to bring those things out and how to um, cook a recipe with that, you know, with different ingredients and different aspects of the ingredients, how to um, get a gourmet meal out of out of that and um i i would say that it the, the compositional vision is an ongoing everyday thing you're always thinking about that you're always thinking about 
uh, different ways to bring the instruments together or to or to explode the um, cohesiveness at the center of it and different ways for it to kind of refigure after the explosion. Those are things we think about all the time. And, and so the theme of the album is the construction of a universe. That's why it's called World Construct. What goes into making a day? I mean, any of us, we get up in the morning, you, you know, you, you might have plans for the day. The plans get interrupted by events. Um, uh, what, what was it? Who was it? John Lennon said something that life, there's, you know, your plans and then life is what intervenes, you know. So, I mean, it's, it's the same thing with the kind of nexus between jazz improvisation and composition that um, certain things are planned, other things arise and, quote, get in the way. <laughs> And maybe get in the way is not quite the word. It's, they just happen and have to be dealt with. And the, um, the thing that's great about jazz improvisation slash composition is that you're always looking for solutions to whatever arises. And, um, you know, that's kind of what this is. So that's the theme of the album. And, and you know, there's, if there's a theme, because I don't really know if instrumental music per se has themes. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the composer can assert that there is a theme or they, they can have something in the back of their mind. Um, but unless you're doing a complete sound tone, po tone poem, like I say about a location or, you know, it, it's, kind, it, it's kind of subjective taking abstract sounds and, and fascinating them onto a concrete thing. Um, so anyway, that's the theme of the album, if there is a theme. That, that's a great answer, and I, I never really quite thought of it like that before, but Ellington writing for Johnny Hodges or, right. or, or some of the other players, give me an idea, can you break that down, how you would consider, like, Michael Bissio's personality or his playing or his latent um, ways of reacting, how does that figure into the way you would compose for them or present your music or even improvise with them? I've never heard anybody discuss well, it like that. Um, people have things in their vocabulary that they think are their signature. They have things that they go back to because that's what they think their personality is. And then they have many things that they hint at that they don't even realize that you can build a whole thing off of. So I, I, I would I would assume as the quote leader slash psychologist slash um, huh. uh, composer of the group, if I'm going to if 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 I'm taking the, whatever ensemble is in front of me and um, the idea is to have a real meshing of all the components of all the vocabularies of the people involved, I, I try to be cognizant of what people hint at at times or little things you hear in their playing that they might not emphasize and then find ways to subtly um, bring those things forward, which might even be a surprise to them because they might hint on things in their playing that they don't even realize are there. So um, I see my job as a manipulator, kind of. I mean, I manipulate things out of them. Um, because if you leave people up to their own devices, they're going to, and you know, this goes for me too, they're going to um, go in default mode to things that they think um, represent them. And then at times of the most inspiration, they will maybe go outside of that or above it somehow. But the idea is to um, co constantly shift the components. I mean, the components are all all there all the time, all of them, but the kind of shift the emphasis on different things. And that's what changes, you know, this product of today from that product of yesterday is kind of a reshuffling of elements um, because how, how often does anybody 
completely go outside of themselves. That that hardly ever happens. I mean, that maybe maybe happens at the height of inspiration, and and you can lose yourself and, and go above it. But usually, you're dealing with a reshuffling of components. That's. I mean, when I was a the brief period of time I was a musician, I can count on one hand those times when. The instrument was playing me it was very right. infrequent when you hit that magic thing but someone like yourself that ratio seems to be much much higher obviously when you're improvising and opening yourself up to all these different fields how does one you're talking about reshuffling are you how do you reshuffle your own elements in performance to reach those levels of improv those amazingly high levels of improvisation Right. What, well, what goes on mentally, or is it all non-mental? It has to be mental at some point. Um, well, it's mental in the practice room. But on the stage, it has to be completely unmental. And I, I would say that the key... I mean, I don't think I, um, the instrument's playing me all the time. I mean, I, may, I maybe for whatever reason, in my development and ways I practiced, I, I came to a format where that might be possible more than some people. But there's still the element of me as a quote finite human being fighting the instrument you know to some degree um but i would say the key to that being able to happen is some mixture of complete and utter relaxation and some mixture of not caring and if you can combine those in a way where you've you've really taken care of business in the practice room then maybe that can happen more often on stage in front of people if, if you if you reach such a level of relaxation and you, you the way your personality is structured is you really don't care and you can just surrender over to the music to whatever that field of energy or la and language that you um, manifest when you play then it, with the, if those two things are in place and and you've taken care of business in the practice room then you can probably reach um, degrees of, of transcendental, um, I don't know if disconnection is the right word, but transcendental going above yourself more often than not, or more often than some people are that are concerned with um, what people think about them, or not just able to rela completely relax and surrender to the music. Are there any places during improvisation, because you're still, you know, still a thought process going on are there places you ever won't go you say well I can't go there is it uh, ever that concrete um, I, I go wherever I, I, I the, the voices in my head tell me to go so <laughs> um, I, now I mean there's things I won't do myself because they fall outside of my avenue of taste such as um, I don't use like there's some avenue players that you like use elbows or fists or things. I, I just don't do that. I I always use some quasi traditional technique, even if my body language is such is not you know is different. And the way I thrust my arms and stuff, I still the actual technique I use is quasi traditional. And maybe I'm brainwashed by my training, but that's just the way it goes, you know. Um, for me and. It, it's not a matter, it's just, you know, that's who I am. But if, if the voice is in my head, and please nobody don't call the straight jacket people, you know, for me saying that, but I, I'm alluding to something. But if the voice is in my head while I'm playing, tell me to go somewhere, I'll, I'll go there. Could you talk more about that? Because I think people don't understand, well, none of us really understand what goes on in the minds of improvisers like yourself who have taken it to such a, profound uh, level you're not just taking a piano solo over 32 bars or whatever right. the, the the journey you go through a uh, solo do, do you ever have does one solo connect to a solo or an improvisation you might have played nights before oh, everything is connected I mean that's the thing I and mean, that's the thing about um, like the whole all the music on a metaphysical level if you could look at it from another plane it's just all there at one block so you're it's like you're going into the cloud like if i could maybe use that and, and extracting things 
every time, but it's all it's all one metaphysical whole in, in a realm that maybe we can't hear, see, quote, see, but the relaxation allows you to just be passive and let it th flow through you. So that's um, the quest, but um, it's all connected. I mean, every er, er, everything is connected on some level, even if, if the connection is not easily seen from where we sit or you know if a listener doesn't pick up on it um yes a solo i did today is definitely connected to something i did 10 years ago or albeit by natural processes it, it has morphed changed um evolved if you want to look at it as metastasis i mean there you know you can look at all kinds of words but but it's language. The language is a live force that exists somewhere. I mean, and I don't on some frequency or some level, and we're, we're tapping into it. And um, it's all, I, I call it the master chord. Just kind of using the language from harmony. It's all all there. I mean, somehow every note I played from the time I was first played to. The, whenever I, you know, say that, that I will be done and give up the last breath, already exists in the cloud. I, I'm just um, extracting it little by little in a quasi hallucinatory, um, illusionary break off of time. But it, it's all there, and therefore all connected. Um, it's all out of one stem of language, but. It constantly on its own by some organic process we can never understand morphs evolves changes um, and that's the human brain is not equipped to understand what that is people today like to call what Alice Coltrane sort of began and other people I guess spiritual jazz right. even though I'm pretty good friends with Mike Clark the headhunters drummer right. and he said they had referred to the music back then as spiritual jazz Maybe sub headhunters would be considered that. What role does, because you're moving past just the realm of the soul and the brain, you're going into something spiritual to whatever degree most people can understand what that term means. Something that's not seen but is definitely there. Right. What part does that play in what you're doing? Um, or is it hard to know? And, cut that line. I, I'm not exactly sure what part does what play. Um, the idea of moving past the mental oh. or the emotional into something deeper. Okay, well, at the end of the day, I'm a human being playing music, so, um, you know, it, um, when you ask, like, why do you play music? Well, hey, I started as a kid and people told me I was decent at it, so you keep going. B, you know, if, if you, once you decide like to make a career of it, you know, you, you basically think you can feed your family. In the quest for like the transcendental in the language, the, the thing to realize- That's it, that's what I'm thinking of, right. the transcendental. The thing to realize is that as a, as a musician, um, you know, you're a human being sitting at an inanimate object, which whatever the instrument is and um, the, the, even if the language is something out there a field of vibrations you know you're playing this in Adam you're playing this physical object and at the same time as a human being um, you know there's many reasons why you decide to become a professional musician you start taking lessons people tell you that you might have talent you keep going then you see it as a possibility to, to make a living at it, um, their social status, as far as playing, you know, becomes an instrument. Like the, you know, some of the greatest, like Duke Ellington, one of the things that got him into playing was that he could, thought he could pick up women by playing music, and that was one of his initial um, um, motivations was picking up females. So, well, I mean, whatever. All of that is, you know, you're a human being playing an instrument for all the regular human things that are involved with that. At the same time, that you know, at a certain point, you might get a relationship to the language that is quasi-religious. And 
um, you start relating to the actual energy fields and the language that you're tapping into. And, you know, it becomes a different thing at that point. Um, now, how far can you go? I don't know. I mean, if I had my ways, if, if, if I had my ways, the, I, I, I would, you, you know, not that music is an escape mechanism for me, but it's a pure vibratory language. And, you know, there's a lot of ugly things in this world out here. And the music, when you, when you kind of inundate yourself with the vibrations of the music, it is an escape from a lot of the ugliness that exists out here in the world. And if I had my ways, I would just become the one who just ceased to be human. I just, like maybe the piano would open up and I'd just step into it. Oh, I love that. And walk into the pure vibrational field. Wow. But, uh, that's, that to me, it, what, what Chris I is talking love about heaven. That. that to me is what heaven is. But, um, but um, you know, I don't know how far it can go. I, everybody, Coltrane, thought it could go pretty far and in and, and the music it did go far for him well speaking of Coltrane what do you think where do you th where do you think he was heading and where would he have headed after he would found what he was seeking for just your own opinion my own opinion this is going to sound kind of harsh but since you asked for my opinion I've always thought that Coltrane went as far as he could uh, I thought to, in my mind like Sonship that album was kind of the crowning achievement of, and I, I never thought he could go into the quote pure avant garde in the way Albert Eiler was was a starting point for him. So I thought, and I I never thought Coltrane could go back to anything. So I, I think poetically he reached his highest point as far as pure poetics with the Love Supreme. I I think as far as um outlining the possibilities of a, possibilities of a new avant garde. Sonship was like kind of the height of that and I think he was at a dead end and I think for whatever of the energy configuration he was he went as far as he could go and I think and my this is you asked my opinion you know somebody could say I'm completely full of it but this is what I I think he kind of realized that on a subconscious level and I think there's a part of him that a deep deep hidden part of him that willed his sickness and he wanted out of here of the planet because I think he thought um and it, uh, this is my opinion I mean I entitled to my opinion so I don't want anybody jumping over me for saying what seems to me to be the case um I could be totally wrong but I I don't think he had anywhere else to go given who he was because I think given that he was John Coltrane that is what the contribution was to be and I don't think he had a a life further than that so I think on a very deep subconscious level he thought he had done his best and it was time to leave the planet no I can I can get with that I've often thought that he had nowhere to go except going back to playing something really simple right right and, and, and if he did go back it would that's exactly right right they, they would have been extremely kind of simplistic statements that would have been prayer like but I don't think he wanted to do that I think his personality structure was once where he just had to keep moving ahead or there was no like reason uh, it, to even kind of continue being on the planet and and i think that restlessness monk picked up on that that restlessness with him when he made kind of um negative comments about culture and i think it was in a blindfold test hmm. and downbeat if i don't remember exactly but he he commented on the fact that he was so restless and had to keep trying things out and, and Monk saw that as um, problematic. Um, wow, that's amazing. That's really something. And it's interesting for me, Sonship. That's an amazing record. It no, kind of crosses the bridge. But when, but I think when it gets into inner cellar space, is that the record with that's what Rashi or Rashi or some of the other periods? I can't even listen to it. As where Albert Eiler is always so poetic. Right. And, and there's this new. Uh, I did a video with. With Jeff Letterer, he produced that new Eiler box, a com some complete radio tapes, and it's there's so much joy in his playing. Oh, no, some of Eiler, it sounds like calypso music. Right, right. I, Eiler is an angel. I mean, it's just I astounding. I don't know where it came from. Yeah, it's just. I wish actually somebody please do an Albert Eiler biography so I can learn more about him. But um, because I I'm trying to figure out how he got to where he did. 
yeah it was just wow right just so to me it's like listening to spiritual unity it's like listening to charlie parker and it's a shame that charlie parker's not more i mean he's revered and all that but in a way people don't care about charlie parker anymore when he just sounds like a bird flying into the window right. it's uh, weird well, I, I mean i never got a sense of people don't care about charlie parker. no i don't mean don't care but like i gauge everything sort of by interest from editors and what sells oh, at that store right, right. and okay, people do gotcha. not buy charlie parker records I they well, <laughs> well you're you know people people jazz buyers until they've listened for many years are kind of like can be herded and manipulated by the media they sort of buy what they're told to buy right. to some degree because media campaigns are flashy and all that but you know that either box sold out in a week across oh, the country Sold out in our store in I hours. I didn't even know there was a new Eiler box. It's out. really a beautiful box. No, no, I, Eiler was. Um, I was talking to Evo Perlman about this, the tenor player. We were just trying to figure out like where it comes from. <laughs> like where did it come from? Because um, it, there's something so um, primordially. Um, um, I, I'm trying trying to think of the right word. Um, There's something so natural about it that, and I, I could get in trouble using that word too because I don't, I, I don't, really? I'm not going to try to define exactly what I mean. But oh, I understand that, yeah. But there's just something so Aller falls outside of any kind of academic way of, of looking at jazz. I mean, he can't, you can't really explain him in any of the academic. Or, or critical cliches that might exist about explaining how a player came about, operated in the world, um, and I, you know, I think it was actually too much for Albert too. I think you know he he was dealing with all this beautiful language, and he was also dealing with the fact that he he kind of maybe really didn't understand the context of the world he was putting this language out in just got to be too much you know where do you feel like after since we're talking about this and you have great insight as a player um i mean obviously i i think of uh i often think of alice coltrane as coltrane's yoko because right. yoko definitely inspired lennon i think and, and so where how to you did alice kind of pick up and move forward because now her music seems more current than ever. It sounds right. totally contemporary. Uh, well, okay. From as a pianist, I look at Alice as the progenitor of a new archetype that I call the cosmic pianist, and I actually consider myself following in that. Totally. Um, she kind of, um, you know, I mean, I'm sure a lot of listeners have seen the clips on YouTube of her playing, you know, as a Detroit bebop player. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden, <laughs> she went somewhere completely different. It, it's not post-McCoy Tyner. Uh, and, and McCoy is, is, is also part of that archetype of a cosmic pianist too, but he reached, he reached that synthesis in a completely different way than Alice did. And Alice is not a continuation of McCoy. She's actually a, a new phenomenon in nature. <laughs> um, she, you know, she's a black pianist. I mean, she's a she. Her 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 headspace encompasses what I I call black universal consciousness. So, a lot of the headspace. I mean, she was a Hindu. Um, so the are you are you Hindu or Buddhist or anything? I. I'm a nothing. <laughs> I mean, my if you look at what I I mean, I, I Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism is a big part of what I read and yeah I mean at, at a certain level I, I actually do do kundalini yoga I don't consider myself a Hindu or anything but I, I, I'm I, I had a Shaktipa or a kundalini ex very intense experience at a very young age um so one could say that I practice Hinduism in a way but I I'm more involved with Taoism as, as far as the philosophy and I grew up Christian and had been involved with Christian mystics such as um, Meister Eckhart, um, Jacob um, Bohem, I'm not sure the exact pronunciation in Germany. Um, Isn't Krishnamurti essentially in, uh, Christian? 
No, Krishnamurti was a Hindu who was born Hindu and then he was picked up by the Theos Theosophical Society and was being groomed to be like the reincarnation of Buddha. And then he re he rejected all that from the Theosophical Society and became like one of the, I, I would call him an, just an anarchist in a sense. He's very mm -hmm. similar to, in that in that way, he's very similar to um, Jesus. To, um, <laughs> to me. <laughs> to um, Ragnish Bhagavan. You know, oh right. He's I just, he, a lot of his. In, in, in the, wait, wait, not, wait. As I, I, since I said he's similar to Ragnish, in the sense that they grew up in a Hindu atmosphere, but they rejected all of that, and and they're kind of anarchists. Not anarchists in the active sense, but they don't believe in anything except for being centered in the self right now, and and all ideologies are to them are. Um, unnecessary so um, he, he, you know Krishnamurti is a very um, yeah I mean that, that's who he is but anyway I, so I don't really practice Hinduism I'm, I'm, I'm nothing I'm, but I, I believe in universal consciousness talk more about that the universal black consciousness no, well, well I, I, okay what I'm saying is Alice Coltrane is a like the content of her playing is very black. I mean, you, when you when you hear the the coloration of a chord in the attack, you know you hear spirituals, you hear that, but it's not Christian. I mean, she's involved with a, a mindset that is kind of very Hindu. It's this being that she was Hindu, and it's universal consciousness. But um, but the sound is very black and and. And it comes from a same religious kind of resonance that spirituals come from, even though you know she's not Christian. Um, and the sound world, the philosoph the philosophical backdrop for the sound world that she evokes was influenced by her husband's quest to take jazz into a universal field of vibratory energy. Yeah, she took it somewhere entirely different than where he was. Right, exactly. No, I mean, she has a very... Uh, again, she to me is the... the she is the um, prototype of the cosmic pianist. That's her archetype that she embodies. And, it's a, it's a, it's a, and uh, to me, she's the first person who tried to really um, be that. I mean, McCoy inhabits that for periods. There's aspects at times in Sun Ra's piano playing where he goes over to that archetype, even though I wouldn't say that's what he's trying to inhabit. But as far as a pianistic um, poetic device, she inhabits that archetype and she kind of developed it. Wow. And her music is very vibratorily alive it's very vibratorily current and it's just um its own kind of world of its own outside of jazz even outside of her husband's work i mean you can you can choose to look at it as an extension but no it's a poetic world in and of itself and um she's never dealt with when you talk about like you know the evolution of jazz pianists because she kind of falls outside of it a little bit um but anyway, I, I look at her as a progenitor of that archetype that I call the cosmic pianist, that I see myself as a member of that archetype, and she is the, the I was, was going to say the, the founding father, but I guess you would call her the founding mother. <laughs> That's really amazing. That, That's how I see her. No, it, I, it makes total sense, blows right. my mind, and someone from your position can really kind of delineate it. And refine those things i think that's just amazing i you know it's interesting how the whole uk scene has really picked up on this idea of spiritual jazz and alice right. Colt, and they've really just eaten it up are, are do, do you get a different response in europe the uk than you do when you play here um no people are people i mean I, yeah i mean you always hear i mean if people come out they hear the music they're all everybody's dealing with vibrations and they all vibrate or don't vibrate to the music as human beings so i you know i i don't necessarily think european audiences are more sophisticated i mean there might be more of a tradition of 
a certain type of sophistication in some parts of Europe because they're maybe more used to going out to jazz festivals and stuff. Are you aware of this? I'm sure you are, but are you into any of these UK people like this, this duo Binker and Golding trying to kind of pick up a Coltrane, Eiler thing, sort of? To my, to my way of thinking, none of those players have the technique of American players. Not that you need technique to say any of this stuff, right, right. but all these different artists have really... There's a woman named Emma Jean Thackeray who uh, studied traditional brass bands, and she has a band that she records, and some of that's very... But there's tons of all these different artists directly pursuing that. Right. I guess no, I, I know the names because I see... You know, I, I kind of consume jazz media. But I don't really have time to like sit around and listen to everybody's CDs. I, I, I just don't have time. Of course, of course. And, and yeah. I, a, lot of, a lot of people that are younger than me, I, I've just never heard them. Because I, I mean, I used to hear a lot of people because I used, you know, I mean, I haven't been touring that much since COVID. But, you know, I, and you're on the road and you're at festivals and you just hear other acts. But I don't at home sit around and listen to other people's. Uh, or people, sure. Or, no, or I, younger people. I understand that. I'm, I'm just fascinated that you know, UK is always able to take, right back to the Beatles, take American music and kind of reinvent it in a right. way. And that's what they're doing, not as profoundly as the Beatles did, in my opinion. But they're really taking that idea of spiritual jazz. And, and I'm curious about this. And you, I, can I just say one? Please thing? do. The one, one people, the UK people I do know, you know, or like like my brother Pat Thomas, great pianist, and Opie, you know, vice player. Um, uh, those guys, you know. I don't know are, them. Who do they play with? Oh, they their own projects. Yeah. What's their names again? Oh, Pat Thomas is pianist. I, I think he's brilliant, man. I I love Pat. Um, and um, Steve Williamson, I think his name is. is yeah, Steve. yeah. Amazing. I mean, that, those are kind of my peers, and I, I right. I've heard them throughout the years, and and they're doing work on such a high level. But um. But uh, yeah, the, a lot of younger people, I just don't have the time. And I'm sure, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad if somebody's picking up directly on the Alice vibe, that's a, a vibe that... It, like, it a, seems generally speaking like there's a trumpet player, Matthew Halsall, that does it. Right. It's kind of it's seeping through all of that stuff. You know, if you have a, a, a smartphone, I, I listen to Giles Peterson once a week. He does a BBC radio yeah, show. He's played some of my stuff. Yeah, and he, and, he pl and he plays all this stuff every weekend. It's just amazing. When thing that I find really interesting with Alice Coltrane is um, I once did um, piano jazz with Miriam McParkland for NPR. I'd love to hear yeah. that. So it's, on, it's on YouTube. You can find it. And it, you know, I had a blast doing that. I was very nervous going in and I don't get nervous. I, I would, maybe nervous is not the right word, but that was one of the few times that I was slightly, you know, like I, I didn't know what to expect and I didn't know what she, she had requested to do me, but I didn't really know what she thought of me. And, the second I we started talking, it was just felt great, right? right. So, when, at one point, I brought up Alice Coltrane, and she went crazy because Marion loves Alice. I mean, she had done it. She said that I, I, she said that was one. I think she had did Alice for a piano. I'm sure she had. And if I remember correctly, I could be wrong. She said that was one of her favorite interviews. And she starts screaming at her producer, who was named Sherry. Sherry Matthew loves. He likes Alice. Oh my God, I love Alice. And I was just shocked of all the people, you know, you would think Mary, you know, Ms. McParkman would be so excited about right. that Alice Coltrane was on I was just like, wow, you know, you know, yeah, it was pretty, pretty profound. Wow. Um, but, um, but she, I, I was just taken aback. I was just shocked. I didn't expect her to be such a lover of Alice Coltrane. Me neither. But, but she is, you know, or she was. Who, um, so who were your, uh early influences and who do you listen to now for inspiration oh uh, okay well language is language so it doesn't really matter who your influences are I mean your influences are conduits for you to to delve in, into language as language and um so you know I could tell you who I listen to but what does it matter I, I you know to get literal um, I scratched my mother and father had a pretty decent record collection, so I spent a lot of my childhood years going through their collection, which consisted of what any, I grew up in the, you know, I'm 61 as we do this now, so I grew up in the late, you know, in the 60s and the early 70s. So if you can imagine any middle class black family, kind of um, what any middle aged black 
mother would have listened to him. That's what my mother had. So that would have been a mixture of, you know, like Johnny Mathis. Um, she had that, a lot of Johnny Mathis albums. But as far as jazz goes, she had um, Jonah Jones, Don Shirley, if you want to call him. She had a lot of pop pianists. She had stuff by Liberace, Rod, Rob, Roger Williams. Um, I love Roger Williams. Yeah, I, know, he was, he was, I used to devour those albums. Um, um, the, the duo, Fletcher and I forgot their name. Ferranti and Teicher? Yeah, yeah, she had stuff by them. And Don Shirley, she had some Liberace. But then she had a lot, she was like a jazz person too. She had Clifford Brown, but she and Clifford was, were friends. He was from my hometown, Wilmington, Delaware. Um, she had some Ramsey Lewis, some, a lot of Count Basie, not much Ellington. You know, in fact, the only Ellington album she had was the, the album he did with um, the Basie band. And I, I, you know, she had a lot of, uh, she had some Miles Davis, they had Kind of Blue, Someday My Prince Will Come. Um, she had a few Louis Armstrong albums, um, some Stan Kenton. Um, they had, my parents had some, um, well, they had some albums of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. I'm just trying to give you a taste of, right. of what they had. Um, uh, uh, you know, they had a lot of, they had some classical, a lot of classical albums, especially like, for instance, they had the Von Cliburn album from the Tchaikovsky competition, which, you know, in the late 50s, I think, or early 60s, was on TV, and that was right. a big deal when he won the, that competition in Russia. They had that album. They had, like, some Ru Arthur Rubenstein. Um, they had some really early RCA kind of things by obscure classical pianists that were really great. I remember they had this Alexander Gennard, this great pianist playing a Chopin oh. Scherzo and C sharp minor. It, it's some of the greatest piano playing I've ever heard. In How my do you life. spell his name? I think it was Alexander Gennard was his name. And you know, it was a CD one side it was like Moonlight Sonata and then side B was like the Chopin <laughs> Scherzo, you know, which is not in any way like a piece like Moonlight Sonata that like it, you know, it, it, kind of a pop, not not a pop classical piece, but you know, something that young people play you know it, it, it was just I don't I don't know what RCA's concept of putting that as a side B but it, but it did make it a side B anyway um, so they had quite a collection of, of stuff that oh a lot of, of Maud Jamal that was my, my mother's favorite pianist and, and and a decent amount of Earl Gardner so I ransacked my parents collection as a kid um, my first album I ever got as a jazz pianist slash record buyer was I got a subscription to Downbeat when I was 12 and you could get a free album so I got that Phineas Newborn Jr. Um, solo album the one with just him as the Sphinx on the cover and that album like changed my life how so I just listened and I devoured it and, and I really internalized every aspect of it uh, then I got into Oscar Peterson but Oscar as you know he was on PBS a lot I remember like seeing it Oscar and oh my parents had a lot of Nina Simone also a, a few a lot of Donna Washington albums some Sarah Vaughan no Ella Fitzgerald by the huh. way which is interesting it is interesting they had a, um, some Carmen McRae a lot um, of Carmen and a lot of Ray Charles they were really into Ray Charles um, um, I, there's a great there's a guy not to interrupt there's a guy on YouTube named Rick Beato has a huge channel talks mostly about rock music but he did one video called the greatest solo ever played and the whole thing was about a, a um, an Oscar Peterson solo that had been recorded on TV with Barney Kessel and Nels Henning Orsted Patterson right. and you see the expressions on their faces as Oscar blows through all these time changes and meter changes and they're just like and then they have to jump on board it's really amazing right right ah. I, I, I probably saw that because I used to watch PBS all the you know, all the jazz. And I, I saw Maud Jamal and Nina Simone when I was 12 on PBS, and that made me really want to be a jazz player. But, because I was just taking classical piano lessons up to that point. But um, after the Phineas Newborn Jr. album, I, I started buying a lot of Oscar Peterson. I never really got the emotional connection to Oscar. And I'm not down on it like a lot of people. I mean, you know, it's, it's a, actually not a really known big fact, but Cecil Taylor was heavy in Oscar Peterson. I mean, even so, he loved Oscar Peterson, oh. <laughs> which, which like, like a lot of people don't know that. Um, I heard of that. But um, I, I, you know, Oscar, I used to, I, I, I used, to, I mean, he was never really emotionally 
home for me. He's so perfect. He's almost too <laughs> perfect. Just perfection to a degree. Right. Uh, whatever. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I was into him kind of heavy for a while. And I heard something recently. Just at a last time I toured Europe, I was at a club and I, I was just hanging out and they played this Oscar Peterson album. And I was like, wow. I mean, I, you know, I was like, I don't, you know, because I've heard stuff that I've actually thought was tasteless. Wow. And this, whatever I heard, I don't know if it was Nitro, I don't remember. Um, it, it was it was spectacular. And, huh. But anyway, after my Oscar Peterson phase, I got into Bill Evans really heavy. And I'm, I'm still kind of a Bill Evans um, devotee. That's amazing. That's fascinating. I wouldn't have thought that. Oh, I, I, Bill Evans is a real touchstone for me. Um, oh. Especially the, the trio with the 401 motion. Yeah, it's pretty... That's, I mean, behind Miles, he's the best seller, I think, in culturing. Right, right. He's right up there with him. At the store, we can't keep those records in stock. Oh, I love that trio. Um, and then I just all of a sudden got into everything. Like, then I Coltrane, you know, and it became like, I, I got into the whole Coltrane world view of, of trying to make jazz. And that's where the spiritual idea came in of making jazz a devotional music or music about the energy fields um and from there i i like pian pianistically mccoy tyner became my favorite pianist <laughs> and um what led you further into the direction you're in now um well I, okay as a kid i i you know I, I was spent a lot of time in the library so if, if you're studying the history of jazz i guess you get a very linear um perspective that this goes to this, that this. Now, you know, overall, in my maturation, I don't believe in a linear anything. I don't believe life really works that way. I, I believe it might have the illusion of working that way, but I don't believe it works that way. But going back, I guess I had a linear mindset. So my ambition, and I'm, I'm trying to reconstruct my head space. My ambition was probably such that you say, okay, I want to be at the forefront of something. So if this is, if Cecil Taylor is what they say is the forefront of something when I was a kid, then I want to be the next step. Now, I, I'm thinking in the language that maybe ambition might think it. You know, a after a while, it be, it's just naturally where you fall or, you know, you're just being the language. But there's many things that operate simultaneously. So, um, you might organically just try and, you know, eventually, in the, in the long run, you might just fall where you naturally organically fall. But ambition is um, an ego, are part of the equation of being a human being. So I guess in trying to reconstruct it at one point, I might have thought that I want to be at the forefront of something and so I should go this direction. You know, on another level, it's the music I really loved. I really loved Sun Ra. I really loved Coltrane. I really loved Albert Eiler. I really loved Cecil Taylor. I really loved Paul Blay. And it felt natural that that would be the way I want to go. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I it's, you think that you can't really reconstruct because when you're younger, like there's just all kinds of tributaries and things are going different directions like at one point I actually did think I was going to probably just do piano trios like in the tradition of Bill Evans kind of piano trio but at the same time I loved um, the music I'm supposedly involved in now and I say supposedly because I don't really believe in the label free jazz so I was composing and, and contemplating a personality such as the person musical personality that I now occupy but I did at one point think I was going to um, probably do trio gigs in club supper clubs and play standards you know maybe in a, in, a, in my own language but in a, in a way not unsimilar to the Bill Evans trio and all those things kind of coexisted I as a teenager I used to really like kind of worship Joe Bonner who played in mm. Farrell Sanders band the pianist and I mean, when I say worship, the, and the reason I, I, I looked up to him is because I myself contemplated and wanted to be um, a pianist in a tenor player's band and a tenor player who was like a post Coltrane player with a big sound. And I did end up manifesting that 
that thing when I played 16 years in the David S. Ware Quartet. But I'm, I'm saying all these, like me wanting to be in a, a, a tenor player who had a big sound band as a teenager coexisted with me thinking I was going to be playing trio in supper clubs in a setting not unlike the Bill Evans trio coincided with me loving what was called free jazz and having the ambition to want to be seen as the next thing after Cecil Taylor. All those things kind of coexisted in my brain all at the same time and I you know they, they didn't present conflict to me they were just different things that existed in my brain and you're just trying doing different things not kind of knowing where everything's going to land and that's where I was as a teenager. At one point I, I, went get, I, I studied with Dennis Sandoli who's a guitarist but he was a composition teacher in Philly and he was Coltrane's teacher and um, I, I just always give reverence, respect and love to Dennis um, because he was a major guru in my life. Um, I also really developed a fascination for the world of Tristano in my late teens and I grew to really love, I mean I, I loved Lenny's music, but I really, really <laughs> grew to love Sal Mosca, the pianist, and Warren Marsh's music. Why is that? Um, it's so pure. Oh. They're pure. Uh, Warren Marsh and Sal Mosca are angels in the sense that they're just pure, pure musicians. And, um, I, you know, I never understand what people mean when they say, and I, you know, I've spent a lot of time with Beepa. I, I know the, the language in the world of Beepa. Uh, and people talk about, jazz pedagogy talks about um, playing through changes, um, or there's no such thing as playing through changes. I mean, well, except for Warren Martin. <laughs> I don't really believe that, I mean, I don't believe Charlie Parker and Bud Powell played through the changes. They obviously knew the changes, but they, to me, played pulsating, played pulsating energy fields that had melodic fragments that you could play through any set of chord changes, and their adaptability to it was such that they could take the vibrating energy fields and the tone colors and the beauty of the melodic fragments that they knew how to manipulate, and they could recombine them and play them through through any chord changes, but they didn't actually play changes in the sense that jazz pedagogy thinks of as playing changes. And I've never really, I, I don't know, there's a lot of really intensely great like sax players that I guess in some ways play changes, in some ways, whatever that means. But to me, I always hear the great improvisers thinking gestalts so they, they, they think in the thrust of the whole chorus and um, they're not really playing through changes in the sense that like it's taught. And I, 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 I would need to really think more how to articulate this better. But I'm going to say Warren Marsh is the only, I mean, I, I never heard any, any, what he does on one level is simple, but on another level, nobody can do it, no one. I don't know his music hardly at right. all. What do you recommend um, you hear from Warren Marsh? Any of the, it's probably better to listen to the stuff he does without, without any rhythm, without a guitar or piano, because he doesn't really need that to 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 um, generate the space time kind of um, things that he does. But if you're going to listen with piano, the, the quartet stuff with Sal Mosk, especially the stuff that was done at the Village Vanguard, those two. Um, things are, are beyond the beyond, and they're they're just outer space music. But I never heard anybody so comfortable with chord changes, but yet not captured, but not a prisoner of them. Um, and, and and he sees in the gestalt and is um. But but at the same time, he's he is comfortable change to change to change too, and he simultaneously both are going on at the same time. Um, so anyway, all that has to say, I developed a serious fascination at one point with the world of um, Sal Moscow and Warren Marsh that, that goes way beyond the Lenny Tristano world. Um, and I'm not the only one, I mean, Cecil Taylor was really influenced by Lenny. And I've had some, had some very interesting conversations with Cecil about Lenny. Okay. But anyway. Um, so, what, so what's next? 
What's um, up coming for Matthew Shaw? Um, I'm just riding now. I'm 61. Uh, don't expect any massive like change. I'm just get up in the morning. I'll probably be doing mostly solo piano, some stuff with my trio, and some duos with Evil Perlman, a tenor sax player I play with. But other than that, I'm just focused on my main th- the focus is on um, my solo language and just I want to just play in churches and galleries, and intimate settings where I with, with they have a nice piano and do beautiful solo concerts and. I want to promote my trio album also and do choice festivals with the trio. That that's my goal. But nothing to say per se to say that's like so um, revolutionary as far as my world goes. Um, I'm set in my ways in some ways of thinking about it. Well, this was as enlightening and immersive and as humbling a conversation as I thought it would be. Yeah, thank. You. <laughs> so thank you, man. I mean. Uh, Thank you, Matthew. Thank you.